Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Joining us on the show today, we have two-term DAP Member of Parliament, Ong Kian Ming. He recently announced his decision not to defend his Bangi seat in the 15th general elections and to take a break from active politics. Kian Ming, welcome to the show. It's good of you to join us. Let's talk about this bombshell that you dropped. Um, was that a long a decision long long time coming? Was that always the plan to only serve two terms? Or have you was this a decision that you made uh, due to recent circumstances? Uh, hi, uh, Melissa, as well as uh, Sharad. I'm joining you with my Rubik's Cube uh, in my home office. Uh, thanks for inviting me to share some views and thoughts on my recent uh, announcement. Uh, actually, the decision uh, was uh, already talked about uh, among certain party leaders since last year. Uh, last October, to be specific, uh, I had already indicated uh, to uh, YB Tony Pua, my colleague who brought me into the party, that I was uh, seriously considering uh, not contesting in the next uh, general election. Uh, and I also told him the reasons why. Uh, and, uh, you know, subsequently, uh, there were certain things that happened along the way uh, that confirmed my decision uh, not to run uh, in the next general election, which I'm sure we can talk about in further detail. Ken Ming, you have given many interviews already kind of, uh, you know, uh, elaborating the, the reasons and the dynamics uh, behind the decision, including the fact that you might not have been in step with, uh, with party members. And I wonder if you could just help us understand that at a deeper level. Was it simply your decision to uh, promote the idea of an MOU uh, at the, the kind of like the final stages of the Muidin administration? Or does the, um, the issue go deeper? Is it a, a difference in political outlook between you and some of your colleagues uh, that sort of uh, put you in a very difficult position after you made those um, positions very clear. Yeah, uh, so just to clarify a bit, uh, I don't think I was out of lockstep with the party members. Uh, I think there were some perhaps uh, uh, disagreements in terms of the direction of the party as well as the coalition in terms of strategy moving forward. Uh, and the CSA that was proposed by Muhyiddin, uh, which was uh, in some ways uh, negotiated and discussed uh, by Mohidin's representatives with myself and uh, Tony Poa uh, was emblematic of that uh, larger uh, disagreement in terms of uh, the, the direction of the party and the coalition. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I think one of the reasons why we felt it was necessary to think out of the box, uh, to consider accepting or at least not rejecting outright a Mohidin CSA offer uh, is that we knew uh, Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim did not have the numbers uh, to form uh, the government, uh, even if, let's say, Tan Sri Muhyiddin were to step down. Uh, so, you know, to just reject uh, that proposal uh, in favour of short-term populist uh, kind of uh, knee-jerk reaction uh, by certain party leaders, uh, not just in my party, but also other uh, component parties, uh, and not to see the larger picture, uh, which I think uh, most analysts uh, would look at the current situation and probably think that there may have been good reasons, good strategical uh, reasons, strategic reasons to accept Muhyiddin's uh, CSA offer. I think uh, that is one of the challenges that uh, DAP as well as Pakatan Harapan uh, needs to face uh, moving into the next general election and even beyond. Well, but it wasn't just party leadership that had trouble accepting the CSA or the MOU. Even public buy-in was was weak for this MOU. We saw that in you know the the by-elections, the subsequent by-elections, that that was in fact an issue for many who saw that perhaps as Pakatan Harapan maybe selling out to work to, with uh, Ismail Sabri's um, government. Can I ask you? Looking back, taking a step back and perhaps looking at a more broader view, when you think about MOUs, you think about CSAs, the, what has the process of negotiating, the try, trying to get the public buy-in, all of that, the political and electoral cost that comes with, uh, with, with a, an agreement like this, what has that taught you about compromise and bipartisanship in Malaysia? Okay, um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I think that Political leaders should lead 
uh, public opinion, especially in times of unprecedented crisis, uh, both economic, political and health related in the country as what we uh, were facing uh, during the last two years of COVID. Uh, hence, even if let's say public opinion was strongly against the CSA, uh, perhaps less strong against the MOU later on, uh, when people realized that we needed some stability in the country, uh, political leaders should look at the broader strategic considerations uh, and make decisions based on the longer, longer, longer term interests of the country, uh, including, for example, uh, the, the possibility of equal allocation at the constituency level among all MPs, uh, this anti-hopping uh, law or constitutional amendment that we are you know, at the final stages of discussion, and other political reforms that even if, let's say, the larger public doesn't feel immediately uh, would be good institutional reforms that Pakatan Harapan and DAP has been pushing for, for a long time. Right, to re so to reject all these uh, uh, institutional reforms just because uh, of uh, you know certain uh, public uh, backlash uh, because everyone wants wanted to put Muhyiddin down for what he did uh, to us in Sheraton move I think is to miss the uh, forest for the trees and if let's say you want to take a step even further back and look at the bigger picture I think one of the reasons why the larger public is uh, disenchanted with uh, Pakata Harapan is because after the Sheraton move, we did not provide clear leadership and also a direction uh, for the country uh, to lead us out of COVID. I think those who attribute our performance in the state elections to us signing the CSA, the, the MOU, I think is very short-sighted uh, because it really misses the fact that I think we could have been on the road, uh, you know, even if let's say we didn't win those two state elections, we could have been on the road to creating a better and more convincing narrative for the public if we had gotten our act together and provide clear leadership on how to lead the country out of COVID. And I think uh, what we did instead was mostly point fingers at the federal government uh, and uh, without actually offering a clear alternative in terms of what we would have done if we were in government and what we would do if we were to become government again. Uh, Kiming, I wonder if this, uh, you know, in some ways, the Pakatan Harapan had painted itself into a corner with the rhetoric of, you know, tre uh, treachery, pengkhianat, all these things, the, uh, kind of driving uh, a ground sentiment uh, against those individuals and parties that had um, broken away from the Pakatan Harapan coalition. And then by doing that and playing only on sentiment, uh, and refusing to kind of deal with the more pragmatic issues, as you pointed out, that it wasn't able to turn back. I mean, what has gone on with the with the thinking, or is is there real thinking in terms of communication in Pakatan Harapan? What's been the conversation that you've been in to try and shift it to, as it were, the broader picture, the more pragmatic um, approach to uh, politics? Uh, I think that. The narrative on Pengkhiana uh, traitors and all that uh, probably couldn't have been avoided because the feelings were very raw and uh, I think emotions were running high. Even uh, with myself, uh, you know, I worked together with people like uh, Saifuddin Abdullah, uh, with uh, many of the you know so-called reformers uh, that later on switched positions and uh, you know joined the uh, joined uh, uh, the other side. Uh, and, and definitely, you know, I would be disappointed with uh, many of their actions uh, in, in terms of betraying the, the coalition. Uh, but of course, we need to also realize that uh, the writing was on the wall uh, in terms of some of the larger uh, public uh, reactions, uh, if you will, uh, in regards to the whole Karajan Gagal movement, for example. Uh, this is on hindsight, of course, but uh, the fact that you know we had a Krajan Gagal narrative that was playing being played out on social media in a, in a very strong way, and yet the same Krajan Gagal, which comprised of uh, you know uh, many many of the the characters that we see in Muhyiddin's government as well as Sabri's government, uh, won uh, big in the Malacca as well as Johor state elections, showed to me that we were not able to to convince the public that we were a better alternative. Right? And I think going on emotions, uh, you know, in terms of criticizing the government alone, uh, will not be able to win us more votes, especially among the, the larger Malay voter base, uh, because they actually want to see leadership uh, on, on how we can actually govern, govern differently, apart from the normal, uh, you know, calls for greater transparency and, and uh, anti-corruption, which are important, but, you know, it's not necessary, but not sufficient. But you, you've said in other interviews, you said the Harapan needs to keep its options open. Um, and I'm just wondering whether 
you think that that advice might be heeded by party leadership, not just party leadership, but also how that might resonate with uh, the sentiment on the ground? Uh, I think that, again, uh, we, I just want to repeat that we are living in unprecedented political times in the country uh, in the sense that uh, we can not imagine, we would never have been able to imagine a situation whereby uh, UMNO would not be a dominant party and that uh, BN would not be a dominant coalition. Right? So moving forward, uh, you know, my colleague Liu Chintong has also expressed this publicly. You know, we are in a situation where there are sort of like three kingdoms. Uh, the, 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 the coalition led by Bersatu, uh, Pakatan Harapan, as well as Barisan National. So we do not know the kind of political configurations that would be necessary uh, to govern at the national level as, as well as at the state levels moving forward. Uh, and if, let's say, we were to look ahead you know, 10, 20 years down the road, where we are at a much more politically matured kind of a stage of our political development, we may imagine a situation whereby we are at opposition at the federal level uh, with one, uh, against one coalition, but we are together at the state, uh, you know, at the state level, together with that same coalition uh, governing that state. This is uh, par for the cost for countries like uh, Germany, for example, uh, where it's happened many times. Uh, other federal countries have also experienced uh, similar kind of models. Right. So when I say we need to keep our uh, options flexible, this is thinking both short, medium, as well as long term. Uh, but it's, it's not so easy for the public to understand. It's also not easy for many of the political leaders to explain this kind of flexibility. OK, Ken, we we're going to take a quick break on the show. Let's come back and continue this conversation. We will be right back on Consider This. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Thanks so much for staying with Sharad and I on Consider This. Let's continue our conversation with Bangi MP Ong Kian Ming. He recently announced that he will not be uh, putting himself up as a candidate in GE15 and will be taking a step away from active politics. Sharad, you had a question. Kian Ming, you, you started your career off uh, in, you know, in the academic world, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and you, you did a lot of analysis of you know, the voting trends and so on and so forth. You didn't decide to get into active politics. Was there a reason that you felt that active politics, becoming an MP, uh, joining a political party, all these would in fact lead to some sort of change? I'm assuming that behind all your actions, including the recent one, there is a kind of a theory of change. It's a, very, it's a popular, it's sort of a buzzword now, right? A theory of change. What is your theory of change, Ken Ming? Uh, I, first of all, I have no regrets joining the political arena as a frontliner. Uh, it's been a fantastic ride over the past nine years, and I'll continue to serve out my term, obviously, as Member of Parliament for Bangi. Uh, I've met so many wonderful and incredible people as a Member of Parliament, uh, both in my constituency as well as in my travels around the country, uh, as a Member of Parliament, as a politician, as well as as a Deputy Minister. Uh, so I would encourage young people who aspire to want to join politics uh, to really uh, uh, you know, keep the faith and know that good things can come through political activism and also political activity. Uh, and I have seen that with my own eyes, because like you say, the theory of change uh, you know, is part and parcel of what has happened in Malaysia over the past, uh, I would say, three general elections, starting with 2000 and uh, the 2008 general elections. Uh, and I have seen my own positive contribution in a small way. Uh, so for example, I was the DAP representative for the uh, manifesto committee uh, for Pakatan Harapan before the 14th general election. And it was quite good to see some of these uh, uh, proposals being implemented, such as the uh, 100 ringgit, sorry, the 50 ringgit, uh, the 100 ringgit unlimited uh, travel pass uh, that was uh, implemented when uh, Anthony Lok was the transportation minister. Uh, this was something that I put inside the manifesto. And there were a number of uh, other initiatives related to renewable energy that Yobin also, uh, you know, very uh, ably tried to execute uh, in her short time as a minister as well. So definitely the kind of impact that good politicians have, and I hope that I can call myself one, uh, you know, would be able to uh, impact, uh, you know, positively. And, okay. and you, uh, yeah. 
just on that note, if I may interrupt you, um, I think there are many who hold the view that you have performed well in your time as Deputy Minister and many would hold you in this, you know, a, as a good politician. Some commentators even said that, you know, you wanting to step away from active politics ca has is seen to be an example of political brain drain and that might discourage people who are already um, disenfranchised with Malaysian politics. What would you, how would you respond to that? Uh, I would I would somewhat disagree with uh, that particular viewpoint uh, because uh, like what I said in my public statement, uh, I'm stepping away temporarily. I'm not retiring from politics. You know, I'm not that, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, middle age. I'm not that <laughs> old yet. I still think that I have something con uh, positive to, to contribute to public policy making in the country. Uh, but I, I am confident uh, that my party has a gr good group of uh, capable and able uh, leaders led by the Secretary General Anthony Lok, uh, who would promote and give opportunities to other younger and more capable leaders to step up to the plate. Uh, so, you know, I said this publicly uh, that I have already proposed a name, uh, a person who is younger than myself uh, to replace me as uh, the candidate for Bangi uh, to the leadership. And if let's say the leadership uh, is uh, willing to make this uh, public uh, sooner rather than later, then definitely I'll be working with this individual uh, and people will be able to see that, look, this is part and parcel of a normal transition process, which perhaps can happen in other places as well, other constituencies, among other leaders who may want to uh, take a step back and then give a chance uh, and announce early and give a chance for his or her successor uh, to sort of like uh, have time to, uh, you know, build his own base, build his own ground in the constituency and get ready for the next general election. I mean, Kenry, you must be one of the rare politicians willing to step back, perhaps because you actually have uh, skills that you can market in other uh, fields. But I, I, I do want to come back to the question of where uh, effective change can happen in this country. Considering that we are nominally democratic, we have had six decades of authoritarian rule, we have uh, a crisis in our institutions, they've been hollowed out since Mahathir's first time as prime minister, everything from the judiciary to our civil service. This is a country in crisis. Is party politics the only real effective vehicle for change? Is there a space for civil society? Is there a space for think tanks, uh, which I imagine you might retreat to? Where can you make a real difference in this country, considering our context? Yeah, thanks, Sharad, for uh, thinking that I have other marketable skills uh, after my uh, uh, political career, or at least this phase of my political career is over. I think you're absolutely right in saying that there are other avenues for people to contribute, uh, whether it is in uh, civil society, such as uh, Berse, that I think continues, continues to make a, a big impact in terms of uh, areas of electoral reform, uh, Transparency International and uh, C4 and other civil society actors who are very active on, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, transparency related matters, uh, anti-corruption matters. And then also uh, ideas uh, and uh, many other think tanks that have sprouted out uh, over the over the past ten years, you know, and many young capable people are working in these places. Uh, I think that the civil service plays a, a very important role in terms of uh, checking, uh, you know, and balancing and and working together with uh, the government of the day, uh, so that you know the objectives uh, of the larger uh, public policy machinery in this country can be can be uh, implemented. And there are also many other agencies uh, and uh, actors, uh, you know, institutions like uh, Bank Nagara, for example, the Securities Commission. Uh, they also have important role to play, you know, in the country. So I think there are many, uh, many places uh, where people can contribute. Uh, but of course, in politics, because of the stakes at play, because of the power that I've seen uh, politicians, ministers, uh, you know, prime ministers can wield, uh, this is where I think uh, still a lot of the important action will take place. Okay, Ken Ming, you said that you stepped, uh, you're announcing this decision early to make way for a successor to uh, get ready, so to speak. I'm wondering what lessons you've learned as a two-term MP, first in Serdang and now uh, and now in Bangi. In Bangi, being this constituency of you know hundreds of thousands of voters, one of the biggest constituencies in the country, what lessons are you hoping to pass on? More importantly, what um, landmines are you hoping they can learn to sidestep? Yeah, uh, just for the record, Bangi is the largest parliamentary constituency in Malaysia. 
uh, with 300,000 voters, uh, probably more uh, you know, by the time the general elections come because of automatic uh, voter registration. Uh, it's, uh, the, it's a Malay majority uh, constituency, about 52-53% Malay, 38% Chinese, 10% Indians, and uh, you know, that's sort of like a very heterogene heterogeneous constituency that is somewhat reflective of the larger population in Malaysia. Uh, so in terms of some of the lessons that I'll pass down to my uh, successor, uh, firstly, uh, have a very good st uh, and strong team at the ground level uh, so that you can uh, work with them to handle uh, matters on the ground, uh, especially to do with uh, different uh, constituency issues. Uh, secondly, don't be afraid to get your hands and feet dirty. You know, I've gone into the rivers in my constituency. I've picked up rubbish. I've uh, done a lot of uh, uh, on the ground stuff, including uh, upgrading a new running track in my, my constituency in Bangi. Uh, so don't be afraid of getting your hands dirty. Uh, and then uh, thirdly, try to use some of your time to mentor uh, the younger generation. Uh, I've had the pleasure of having almost 200 interns uh, over my past uh, 10 years as a, as a member of parliament as well as a party uh, member and leader. Uh, and this is uh, something that I'm quite proud of. Uh, and I hope that my successor can continue that tradition of uh, inculcating young minds and influencing them to play a positive contribution to society. Kimming, okay, so what do we, can we expect to hear from you? Are you going to be working from inside the party? Is there a role for a non-MP to have influence in terms of the party's outlook, its policy agenda? Or is there, is, are you going to be somewhere outside looking into the system and continuing to kind of play the role of a critic from the sidelines, as it were? Uh, I've told the Secretary General of DAP, Anthony Loeb, that I stand ready uh, to provide inputs uh, where and where necessary, whether it's in the issue of uh, area of uh, election analysis or in terms of public policy, uh, finance and the economy, uh, trade, uh, which uh, you know I'm the spokesperson for now for the DAP. Uh, so that kind of role will continue, but from uh, sort of like a support kind of role. Uh, with regards to commentating on uh, Malaysia, uh, I don't really want to be uh, in sort of like the armchair critic kind of role. I hope to be in a position whereby where I can actually put my uh, academic uh, as well as uh, political experience to a uh, good use uh, to write more uh, public policy papers uh, and uh, an analysis that will be helpful to other uh, public policy makers, uh, not just in Malaysia, uh, but, but perhaps uh, on a regional basis. And I think this is something that I uh, look forward to, uh, getting to know more about the ASEAN uh, landscape uh, rather than just uh, to focus on Malaysia, which I've been very focused on for obvious reasons for the past nine years as an MP. All right, Kevin, we hope to uh, catch you on your next adventure, your next chapter. Thank you so much for spending uh, time with us today to talk a little bit about your experience as an MP. Thanks for having me as usual. That was our conversation with Bangi MP Ong Kian Ming, and that wraps up this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sherrod Kutten, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching. Good night. night.